We're back in the studio. The <laughs> studio of my living room. I know. This is the best kind of studio. It's the true. plantiest studio. I know. I don't know if people can see the plants, but we have a whole little plant canopy above us. Yeah, outside of the, the outside of the frame of this video, there are the most beautiful monsteros I've ever seen. It literally makes me so jealous. Every it makes me green with envy seeing all of these monsteros. Your plant wall in your living room is starting to. It's not like pick that up. though. It's not like that. <laughs> you gotta hire my partner. He's like a plant daddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a planty hoe. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So, mm. wow. A lot. Yeah. A lot has gone down for you over the past month. A lot has gone down for the both of us, my dear. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, everybody thinks this is going to be like a Chicago recap marathon, but this is actually going to be all about Jules's marathon today. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see about yeah. that. Yeah. So mm. kind of where are you at right now with your body? How is your body feeling today? Body is actually feeling like really good. Like I would use the term suspiciously good just because I think I'm so used to after marathons, specifically like the hard hilly ones like Atlanta was, like New York is. Um, My body is usually like decimated after these races. And I felt like my body had like pretty fully recovered within a few days of the race. Like I, I took like maybe three full days off and then just have been easy running. But I'm just like, damn, like I actually feel like really good. But it just like taking a break, like more from the mental side of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does that feel to take a break? Because I feel like in the past, oftentimes breaks have been Mm -hmm. um, because you're injured. Mm -hmm. And so this is a little bit different. It honestly has been so nice to just be able to take a break on my own terms. Like that was the best thing about last week. Uh, We went up to Wisconsin after the race, just spent the time with my family. And it was so nice being able to actually let my body rest and just be like, man, like I get to choose this right now. And I'm just kind of like, just like mentally tired from the stress of just like a a long buildup into Chicago and be like, yeah, like I get to just have this time to like recover and enjoy like spending time with my family and go for some like nice walks. It's been just, I feel like just like super like soul filling in a way. I'm so glad to hear that because I don't know if I feel like Molly two years ago, I don't know if that would have been the case. Oh, absolutely not. No, like the break periods after races were always like a nightmare. I think I took one day off after Tokyo. Yeah. Yeah. And usually it's been that like incessant like need to do stuff. And now it's like, no, like I get to feel okay, like giving my body the rest time that I need before we start the build for trials. Yeah. What do you think that's made that possible? That's called growth, baby. (laughs) Um, But no, I think it is just being a lot more comfortable with where I'm at and like being able to appreciate that like I do need this time. Like we've been going so hard leading into this race that appreciating that the downtime is a necessary part of all of this. I think, yeah, I think just being a little bit like mentally weller helps Mm -hmm. with that. I think like it's not that incessant need to like over exercise and treat this as like give it the respect it deserves. Yeah, I think that's part of the marathon. Yeah, yeah, the time after exactly yeah part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's almost like a lot more sustainability. I feel like in the approach. Yeah, that you're kind of having right now. Yeah, I think that's it, and I I know you can probably speak to this too of just like that knowing that the like your body grows in the times where you let it rest and let it recover. It's like you break things down in the workouts and the races, and then you need the time to build back up. And so it's like, you can't have one without the other. And I think I'm appreciating that a little bit more as I get older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's it felt like to have more time, you know, cause Mm -hmm. it's like running twice a day as you do, Yeah, you know, it's kind of like you're on a really (laughs) specific rhythm. Have you felt like you've had more time or yeah, a little bit. It's kind of weird of just like, I, like right now I'm back to just like easy running and it's just like, that is nice for helping me just like set my day. But yeah, it's, uh, I, I tell myself, I'm like, I'm going to get so much done in this period and then I get nothing done. <laughs> like I'm going to do all the chores that I need to do. And then I'm like, no, I'm actually not. Yeah. It's nice. I don't know how I just managed to waste the same amount of time, even though I'm training about half as much. <laughs> Yeah, but that's okay too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's okay to let yourself recharge. Yeah. On all the fronts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, get the laundry done, please. <laughs> Water those plants. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Water my plant babies. Yeah. So let's kind of dig into Chicago a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I'm curious. I know you've shared about it 
in different podcasts and news publications, but this mm. is the first time we're talking about it. We're yeah. saving it for the pod folks. Yeah, I've saved all the juicy parts for Jules. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I want to hear like, yeah, tell me a little bit about how mm. it felt. Were, what were moments that felt really joyful mm. for you in the race? What moments yeah. felt really tough? Like, yeah. let's let's dig in. It was so nice. I think so many of my fears going into this race and fears that I expressed to both John and Matt going in was this fear of like forgetting how to do this after being away for such a long time. Mm. Because yeah, the marathon is just a very specific beast. Like we never hit 26 miles in training. So it's like kind of that unknown And your brain just goes to a very different spot in it. So I'm like, man, like what will happen when I get into this? Can I hold the pace? Will I be able to push when it gets tough? And it was such a, like, it was so nice just getting back into the physical race and being like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. And like, I'm like, I love doing this and I'm pretty good at doing this because I've really struggled in the buildup races and it was so nice just being like, yeah, I got this. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just so different from, and like that kind of confidence that built over the the course of the race of just that like calm, controlled, trusting in my body that I feel like I haven't had in forever. Yeah, what do you think made that possible? Because I mean, even just like, two months or months and a half prior, you know, you had your race in New Haven Mm -hmm. where that wasn't the case, you know, you weren't (laughs) feeling that connection to self in that same way. So what made that possible for Chicago? I think a lot of it was the mental work going in, just really being like setting very healthy expectations and very like process-based goals of like, I feel like so much of the mindset going in was around how I wanted to feel during the race and the the mindset that I wanted to cultivate during the race as like woo-woo as that sounds. But I felt like it was the kind of thing where I wanted to feel the, like, like comfortable and strong and confident and kept really working on building that energy and being like, okay, like these are the things that I need to focus on rather than a certain pace necessarily because there's going to be the pace groups. I can let all of that just fall on Rory, who is the the leader of the pace group that I was in that ended up just being me. <laughs> Everyone's like, did you hire Rory to be your pacer? I'm like, no. It was just, he happened to be in the 222, 223 group. I'm like, that seems like a great pace to go with. Um, but yeah, I felt like it was very focused on like just cultivating that, like that calm in the race Mm. and then having a friend as my pacer there and not getting pulled into going too fast or going out with Sisson and Bates, which I think in the past I would have definitely been like, yeah, like I just need to go and race with them. Like, no, I need to stick with my plan. I felt like that helped so much and just set me up for a really positive experience Mm. that I came away from it feeling like, oh yeah, like I can go faster than this. Like, I feel really good finishing this race. Like, I feel like that was like the, I don't want to use the term rust buster, but like, it was like, kind of like, just like ripping the bandaid off and then realizing that ripping the bandaid off didn't hurt anywhere near as much as I thought it was going to. And being like, yeah, we're good. (laughs) Yeah. That mindset, that strong, that calm, calm, present mindset. Like, Mm -hmm. how do you actually practically like put that into action in a race? Like what in your mind or what are you telling yourself or what's going Mm -hmm. through your mental space to be able to kind of embody that? It was actually funny. So on the way out on the plane, I read, um, I'm, I can't remember the author's name, but it's this book called silence in the age of noise. And it was like, it set my brain like perfectly for what I needed to do because it's this guy who walked across the Antarctic. This is such a tangent, walked across the Antarctic. And his whole thing is like, how do you like, It's like, what is the point of silence in the modern age? And how do you cultivate that sense of silence and calm in yourself to do what you need to do? And it was legitimately like hit me so hard. I'm like, man, this is like literally what I need to be doing in this race because there are so many external factors. There is so much noise. There's so much expectation and just all this shit. And how do I stick to what I need to do, not get pulled out into the crowds, into the other people racing around me and just focus on just my pacer and the blue tangent line on the ground and how I'm moving and what I need to be doing. And I think that was, that was kind of the mental key that I needed going in that I'd been building towards the entire build of just like, yeah, I've got to cultivate that calm, confident silence in my brain when it gets really tough. 
and not let that negativity in the back like get to me. Mm. Wow. How did you come across that book for pre-marathon reading? I literally bought it at Trident Bookstore in Boston. Like it had to have been like a year ago, maybe when I was like going to Falmouth or something. I was like, this looks like a fun book and it's on sale and it looks pretty. Um, and so I bought it and I've had it kind of like just sitting like on my bookshelf for a while. And I just kind of grabbed it on a whim. I was like, this seems like something I could read pretty quickly. It's a very short book. It's like 135 pages and very poetic. It's a beautiful book for mm. like anyone who wants to read it. I feel like that's like this week's re- recommended reading. Um, but no, it was a, a just a fabulous book. And I felt like it was very like meditative and just kind of like applied to so many things that I've been really working on over the last few months. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. Yeah. That silence, that silent mindset. When you were running Chicago, I know there was family, friends there. Mm -hmm. You had some amazing fans who made you signs. Yeah. (laughs) What did you hear during the race? Or what, like, what things did stand out when you were running? I was so blown away by the sheer number of people cheering. Like, I, Rory was joking with me during the race because so many people were cheering for me. It was like, I think you're the most popular person. Like, saying your name. Yeah, saying my name specifically, or had made signs, or, like, all this stuff. And it's that kind of thing. I was just, like almost overwhelmed by it at some point because in my like I'm like man I am such a has-been like nobody care like like I don't know I think just with the time away really I think I like I get so down on myself sometimes and then just hearing that I'm like man like this is so incredible that like like so many people like really do care and are like rooting for me in this way it was really really powerful and uh, like Yeah, I don't know. It was just like one of those things that I'm like kind of amazed sometimes. And even like we did this like sad girl walk afterwards or like just people around like the hotel or whatnot. The people who come up to me and say like, hey, like you've really affected me by talking about this. Like the Runner's World article came out right before the race. So I had a lot of people come up to me and talk to me about that. It means so much. And I think in the past I've been very overwhelmed by things like that because I wasn't in... I didn't have the capacity to handle that because I wasn't in a really good state of mind myself. And now it feels like just because I'm in this much more positive space, I feel like I have so much more capacity to take these things on and like soak up that like energy and like be able to use that positivity. Whereas in the past, I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody's watching me. All these people are cheering and I can't like, like I can't match the expectation that these people have for me of what I'm supposed to be. Mm. And I think now I've seen it as like, these people literally don't give a shit about how I like I run. They're just like excited that I'm out there and doing it. And that means a lot. And it opens me up to be able to do better then too. Yeah. Cause it's not like, Oh, I hope I don't disappoint people. It's just like, man, these people are willing to support me even after I haven't raced for almost two years and like all this stuff. It's, it's a really just, there's so much positivity in the sport. I'm blown away by it sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so touched by hearing that. Like I, yeah, I know, I know how loved you are, but Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you felt how loved you are. Yeah. Like it was, yeah, it was kind of the first time that I was able to like actually be like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there any tears ever during the race or after, or is that? No, just because I feel like when I'm racing, it's a very compartmentalized kind of thing. Like yeah, I felt like it, like it was very powerful, the final like mile and like seeing my family around the final turn. Um, but yeah, it didn't go like to like, like crying happy. It was more of just like, I was like super jazzed. And so I like definitely like yelled out when I saw my family. Um, no, I cried a little when I saw Matt at the finish, but yeah, yeah it was, uh, I felt like when I'm racing, I'm very much of just like, I have a job to execute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was there any moments that you heard John or Matt at all on the course or saw them? I saw them a surprising amount. I honestly don't know how they got around to that many places. Um, They were on their bikes. Um, So yeah, there were multiple points. I couldn't even tell you what miles it was, but I just remember seeing them at multiple points um, and, and knowing like, of like, okay, like we got this because I mean, the last time John saw me in a marathon. It was right before I dropped out of Boston and Matt's never seen me in a marathon before. So that was pretty special. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huge. 
What did it feel like to have a pacer? And has that something been something you've had before? And how did that change your racing experience? No, the only time I've had a pacer was at um, London Marathon when Ailish McColgan like unintentionally ended up being my pacer for probably like, I want to say she stayed in for like maybe 14, 15 miles or so, um, just because the pacer that had been assigned to us dropped out at the first mile. Um, but it was so different. I totally understand why people get pacers for marathons. It is so much easier. Like, it was so nice. Rory was so on it, like so professional. Um he like just it took off so much of like the mental strain of the race of just knowing like literally all I have to do is stay with Rory and he was like super encouraging there was a guy that tried to run out and like hand me a bottle which would have gotten me disqualified and he was just like get off of her like he was like a body blocker and like a cheerleader like all in one it was perfect Wow. One, 10 out of 10, highly recommend it. Get a pacer for all your marathons. <laughs> and did he run the whole race with you? He ran 25 miles with me. Wow. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Oh, yeah. I was like, dude, like, thank you. Because he only got, I think they, like, because he gets paid by the race to do that. And they only tell them that they have to go through, like, 20 miles or so. And he just, like, stayed in and kept doing it. So cool. So, and yeah. did you talk with him at all? Or were you not... In a place where you were like, talking. oh yeah, no, we were talking. We were like, because there was a bunch of guys that were like kind of pacing off of him as well, but then they kept trying to like speed up, and then they were slowing down, and they kept like, come on, guys, we got to speed up and do it, and we're like, no, don't do that. And so we went out a little bit too fast because we kept getting pulled into that, and so he was ve- like, very much of like, hey, we've got to slow it down, and I'm like, hey, like I trust you, like I'm just gonna go off of you, I trust you to pace it. Um, so yeah, we were talking back and forth a little bit um, and like joking a little bit, but yeah, I felt like it was, that made it like just a fun, positive experience too. Like to have your friend pacing you, it was really nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Were there any miles or moments that you could think of that felt like really hard moments or mentally tough where there was like mm-hmm. a decision point for you? Yeah. I feel like the middle miles of the race, kind of that like after halfway but and up to like probably mile like 20 or so are always just tough because you're far enough in that it's starting to like hurt and your legs are hurting. Um, but you're still far enough away. You're like, fuck, there's still like 10 more miles of this race. Um, and so I feel like that right around like 15, 16, 17 is kind of that like, okay, I really need to focus right now. Um, and I fell off the pace a little bit. That's something that like, I definitely want to work on and see like room for improvement there. Um, but yeah, I, I never really hit that like like grinded out like pain zone, which is something that I think part of it too, n- now knowing how a race like Chicago goes, these paced races where I'm not racing, it's more time trial style of staying mentally engaged in those middle miles, I think is going to be pretty key because it's easy to fall off when it's like, oh yeah, like you're not racing against other women. You're, you just have your pacer there. And when you say mentally engaged, tell me more what that means. Like I mentally engaged, it's this very like I I visualize it as a very like forward um like state of mind that mm-hmm. you're staying up on the pace, your body is moving well, like um, like you're almost like pulling yourself forward rather than just coasting. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think it's very easy to fall into that coasting mode in those middle miles because you hit mile 20 and you know, there's only 10 K left so you can go. And in the beginning you're pulled on by all this energy, but those middle miles, it's easy to fall, fall back into that where you're not like, okay, I need to stay right on it. And I definitely fell off a bit. And so it's like in the future realizing like, okay, I need to find ways to, keep myself engaged in what's happening in the race and stay right on that pace that I've chosen rather than letting myself slip a little bit. Yeah. Cause it didn't feel like, I think in the past I've fallen off the pace because like my legs are really tired or I'm feeling it a lot aerobically. And it wasn't that it was almost more of just like, Oh yeah, my brain needs to like get up on it. And I think I definitely got that when I saw Emma Bates in the distance, I was like, Oh, now I've got someone to chase, Mm -hmm. not realizing at the time that she was hurt. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Like let's work on reeling her in. And that's what kind of got me like engaged again. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. interesting. I think that almost like that idea of being like pulled from your center, I sometimes think of like 
especially when I'm running hills, I'll sometimes visualize like almost mm-hmm. like there's a bungee cord attached to my like solar plexus. Yeah. And it's just being like pulled. And so I hear that like yeah. mentally engaged is like that forward movement. Exactly. I think of it almost of like, like if we're doing drills or like running wickets or something, you're coming over your legs or something. And a lot of times when I'm racing, most of what I'm thinking about is like the form that I'm maintaining mm-hmm. um, and how powerfully I'm coming off of like off of my feet. It sounds like this is going to be so niche for people. No, we're here. I'm, <laughs> here for like, I'm so sorry to Lily who's listening right now. Um, but yeah, I feel like it is just that like, okay, how are you staying up on the race and like, like propelling yourself forward? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And let's, well, let's talk about what was on your feet. Cause I know that was kind of like a decision point for you. Mm-hmm. Like, was it two weeks before the race? You had that work on the Kim Fair day mm-hmm. where you tried the other shoes and they weren't a good fit for you. Yeah. Yeah. How did you decide what you were going to wear? For so shoes? after I had this pretty bad workout, um, in Camp Verde where I was supposed to do a 15 mile progression run. I was with M Durgan and I only made it 12 miles because I hit, I was wearing the, um, fast forward Two, which is a new model of shoe that Puma came out with. And these shoes are great. They're so bouncy, like big carbon plate in them. And I feel very like bouncy and propelled forward when I'm wearing them. But I've realized it only, like I can only operate them for about nine miles or so. So I wore them in Falmouth, went great. Wore them for a nine mile tempo, went great. Tried to do this for this longer tempo. And with some of these, like this new iteration of carbon plated shoes and these super foams, you need so much power in your legs to be able to almost like operate that carbon plate. And I found that my glutes and hips just with coming off of the injuries that I've had the last two years are not powerful enough yet to operate them. And so my glutes and my rear hamstrings fatigued so much that I literally could not operate the shoes past nine miles. And it like, I just completely faded, fell off the pace. And I was like, maybe I'm just not fit. And John's like, maybe you just need to wear a different pair of shoes. So I just went back to my normal tried and true, um, DV8 Elite 2. The, um, I wore the original DV8 Elites in the Olympics and all my previous marathons. And so this is the second version of it. And I think with where I'm at right now, like it's just a much, um, like it's much more efficient for me in the latter portions of the marathon to be able to operate those shoes. So yeah, we're, I'm actually going out and doing some shoe testing with Puma in Boston, I think like the week after the New York city marathon. Um, and so we're actually doing efficiency testing with the, like the new, new stuff that's coming in to figure out what's going to be best for trials, which is like, I'm really grateful that we have that resource because shoes are so important to marathoning and figuring out what you're getting the most power out of, even if it's not the most intense, like full max cushion, full carbon plate shoe. I think it's about finding what works for you. Yeah, very mm-hmm. much so. Mm-hmm. And you had a pretty cool kit on. Tell me about your kit. I yeah. Liked it. <laughs> so that kit was actually, I was supposed to wear that in Nagoya and we've had that just tucked away in the closet. So it was called, or so my, um, one of the women who works at Puma, um, Jose, who's in charge of a lot of like all of the elite kits, the elite shoes. She sent this to me and it was called Living Color. And it's this new type of like bio dye. So rather than using petrochemicals to dye, they actually use, I believe it's like phosphorus and plankton or like some sort of cyanobacteria to dye the material. And it's a very environmentally friendly um, like process that they're looking at doing in the future. And I was so stoked that they let me wear this. And I was like kind of worried because I was like, guys, I know I was supposed to wear this at Nagoya and the new kits are out. Would I be okay to wear this original kit that you guys sent? Because it's so cool. And Jose was like, absolutely go for it. Super stoked. Um, Matt did all the photos of it going in. And I feel like you get just like a different kind of energy too. And you know, you're like, oh my God, I look so cool right now. Like it was, it was really fun getting to wear that kit. Oh, yeah. so cool. Yeah. I was, when I watched Chicago, mm-hmm. I was actually on a run on the Futs trail, mm-hmm. the Futs that I was telling you about. Uh, oh, and the terrible Futs. The terrible. We'll talk about that later. What are the best <laughs> urban trails in Flagstaff? Um, the terrible part of the Futs. And I was running and mm-hmm. I had my phone out and I was watching your race <gasps> oh, no. while running. Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> And, I, and then when you crossed the finish line, I stopped and I like shed a couple of tears. Oh, I was so happy and proud of you. Aww, Jules. Yeah. I'm amazed you didn't trip on that shitty part of the fuss while trying to walk. 
much. <laughs> that was great. It was yeah. like so uplifting to I see what that. you and all these other amazing women were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you look back on the race, is there anything what you wish you had done differently? I think there are like, I think the, like the slowing down in the latter portions of the race. And like, I have a real problem that I just need to look at my watch more of like, I legitimately don't look at my watch when I race marathons and I should have just looked at my watch and realized that I was slowing down, um, and like gone for it a little bit more. But I also think like knowing what Chicago was knowing that this is a race that I like, it wasn't meant to be my fastest race ever and not put all this pressure on it. I think like I'm a little bit more okay with it. Um, but definitely coming away from it being like, like I, now that I've like gotten this first race, like done, um, and being like, okay, like I, I see the areas that I need to improve. I'm like, like happy with the time. Um, but definitely be like, okay, like I, I really want to get after it. And I think over the last two years, some of the, it's been a scary thought of being like, man, I have so, like, I have to do all these things. Like if I want to be competitive, there's so many things I have to improve. And now rather than scared, it makes me really excited. I'm like, man, Mm. I have so many things that I can improve on. And that makes me really, really stoked. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are some of those things? I think just in terms of like building up the consistency, I mean, even with having dealt with the anemia over the summer um, and just working out some of the kinks of that, it was a much shorter build than I would have liked. So I'm like, man, like we get a full, like f- like 12 to 15 week build going into trials. So that's really exciting. Working on building up longer tempos just because I didn't get in a tempo longer than 12 miles um, going into this race of like, okay, getting in those longer, steadier efforts, building up the the strength there. And then I think speed, like speed is definitely going to be a big part of it because that's been a really hard aspect coming off of specifically the torn glute and the hip injuries of getting that snappiness, that poppiness and explosivity. And so it's like, it's fun getting to see like almost like chess pieces on the board and know where I need to go. Like if I want to be like where I want to be for trials. Mm. And that's like the fun part now of being like in a, like being in a spot where for so long, John and I have been like, just like, how do we like work through the ED stuff? How do we work through the, like the exhaustion, the injuries, all these other problems. And it's so cool getting to feel knock on wood, knock on wood Sorry, um, that worries. we're in like, a, like just like a healthy spot yeah. and the healthy spot and realize like now the things that we work to improve are like these very specific running things it's like actually working on the running part whereas we've just been like trying to like spot treat all just the life stuff Mm -hmm. yeah so how do you feel like you balance that the long tempos with the speed because I feel like those are kind of like two ends of the spectrum as far Mm -hmm. as training and you're someone who really does high volume yeah and so like how was that gonna happen Um, just reworking the schedule a little bit. I think like we have always like toyed with this idea of like the 14 day schedule that in the past we've always gravitated towards it just because I was too tired to manage a seven day schedule. Cause it's really hard fitting in. Like you do a hard long run on Sunday and then you get one day in between and then a hard speed workout on Tuesday. And that has never worked for me. And I don't know why we keep trying to make a seven day schedule work. Cause I'm just like, I've showed it's not going to work. And a 10 day schedule is literally the most psychotic thing to me because I'm just on different days. And I don't know how MSSN and team boss do that. So 14 day really works well for me. And so I think it's just going to be that of having to shift fully to a 14 day schedule. We always get two days rest in between hard efforts. We get a little bit more focus on the long run almost as like a specific workout. Um, And just by the nature of it, it's going to be winter and Flagstaff, we're probably going to have to go down a lot more. So it's like, okay, let's take advantage of that. If we have to do long runs in Phoenix anyway, might as well make them workouts and might as well, might as well make them fast. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. cool. I'm excited to hear about that like 14 day shift and yeah. kind of see how that practically works. Yeah, we'll see. It's gonna be um it's gonna be kind of interesting to see, but it's like I've done it in the past. We basically did a 14 day schedule leading into Tokyo. So it's like I know it works. Um it's just yeah, being able to figure out the ways to like implement it properly. Yeah. 
When you were in Chicago, did any thoughts in your brain come up around the Olympic trials? Like, did you think about that race at all? Mm, I think there definitely is like a lot of that pressure there. And especially because people like the conversation always comes back to that, especially in interviews, like afterwards, everyone's asking about it. And so it's like, it is a very present thing. And I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think about it quite a bit, just because, yeah, it is like for me, like not for me, but like for everybody, it is like the Olympics are kind of like the pinnacle of our sport and people just focus on those a lot more. Like the majors are important to me, but like my focus is Olympics. And so I think a lot of my thoughts around the Olympic trials rather than like the stress or the, like the comparison, cause it's easy to get sucked into that, especially when you have like with Emma Bates and with Emily Sisson of like two women who are going to be like probably two of the top competitors there it's hard not to get pulled into that or see like, oh man, like they're trying to run so much faster than me at this race. What does that mean for me for the trials? I tried to just shift the thinking into being like, this is a stepping stone for that. And what I need to do to get ready for trials is to just execute my plan in this race. And that'll, that will be a stepping stone to help me get there. And I felt like coming away with having a really solid day that where I checked all the boxes that I needed to, it definitely built some of that just like quiet confidence of like, I'm coming off this race, not thinking that I'm like hot shit and not thinking that I'm the worst thing in the world. It's just like, yeah, like we did what we needed to do. I'm ready to go on to the next step. How did that last mile of Chicago feel? It, it was really fun. It was really fun coming down and just like being able to appreciate being healthy and feeling strong and having my family there and having so many people cheering and just being excited that I get to do this. Cause I like, I talked about it in a little, a little bit in my post after the race, but like, it is very easy to forget when you're in just the grind of training or the grind of injury that it's like racing is just super fun. Like, it's like at the end of the day, marathons are really fun and really cool. And I had forgotten that a little bit. And all of my worries had surrounded like, how am I going to finish this race? This is going to be so grueling. This is going to be so hard. And I forgot that I just feel this sense of joy when I race that it's just like, yeah, it's supposed to be fun. That's why we do it. Like that was the cool part. Yeah. Connecting to that joy. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that feeling of joy is something you'd experienced in past marathons before or was a new, new flavor? Yeah. I think it's like in the, in the races where I've done the best, it's one that ones that I've gone into with that sense of joy. It's what I like. And that's, it was funny going into this race. I think in the, over the last few years, it almost kind of devolved how I felt going into races because it became so stressful and so much pressure and all these things. And I got so focused on the externalities. It's easy to forget that a little bit. And it felt very similar to how it felt going into trials of just like, I have no expectations for how this is going to go. Like, like I'm just having fun going into this. Cause it was like the days leading in. It's like, like with Matt there, with John there, we were just like, hanging out and like doing fun stuff. And I was able to actually enjoy the race in a way that I haven't been able to in such a long time. And that was, I think the really nice thing that it was like, just like the race was almost bonus on top of that. It was like, I put in so much work and I finally get to enjoy this aspect of racing again, which is something that like, I felt like when I was in a really unhealthy place, I just got sapped of all that joy Mm -hmm. and thinking how like thinking how I felt at Boston And just, this was so radically different. And I think that's it. It was like, I need to remember how this feels. And this is the feeling that I want to cultivate in races going forward. Hell yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited for you. Yeah. So this might be a little bit of a hot take territory. Ooh, let's go. (laughs) Oh, baby. Let's go. (laughs) So Olympic trials, start time. Oh my God. I want to hear... If I hear one more person complain about the Olympic trials start time, I'm going to lose it. I heard that, that like they went and petitioned. I feel really bad because a lot of people have like texted me and they're like, sign the petition to move it. I'm like, guys, I'm so sorry, but I do not care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, this is the thing, I think. Like, you can try and control the universe. Like, I think everybody's worried that it's going to be really, really hot. It could be. It could also be super cold, too. 
moving it earlier that time of year, if it is really hot, it's going to be way more humid earlier in the morning. Like, I feel like the old saying of like, the more you try to outsmart the devil, the devil will always win. This is the thing. It's like the more we try to change it and plan it and do all these things, it's like the race is going to be what it's going to be. The Mm -hmm. race was at noon in Atlanta the last time too, and it was like 30 degrees. So it's like, I think with some of these things, and this is nothing against all the people who are petitioning and feel very strongly about this. We're going to get so much shit for this too. I'm so sorry. All the people in the running world. No, but this is important for you to speak your truth on this. I I do honestly feel that like, I truly don't understand why people are making such a big deal about it because it's like, at the end of the day, Paris is going to be crazy hot too. And so it's like, okay, if the race is in really hot conditions, then we're racing in the same exact conditions that are going to be the Olympics. If it's not, then whatever. And it's like, we look at what the average temps have been over the last few, few years, and it's a crapshoot. You have no idea what it's going to be. So it's like, by trying to move and change and plan, it's just like, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm also the person that I never look at the weather going into races too. So it's like, at the end of the day, I really don't care. It's like, the point of trials is to go out and compete on the day. And it's like, you just... We'll go out and do that regardless of what the weather is. Mm -hmm. That's the only option that we have. It's the same thing as like, yeah, I don't know. Like you can try and like, they're not like moving around New York to a nicer day or like the year that does one Boston, they can't move the Boston marathon because it's going to be shit weather on that day. And she showed up and she performed and did it. So it's just like, you take what you get. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely respect that. I think also, Mm -hmm. like, I'm hearing for you, it sounds like just embracing that you can't control all Mm -hmm. the things. Exactly. And I think that's it a little bit of just, like, yeah, like, true racing and tactical style races. Like, that's why Chicago is, like, an incredible time trial style race because they control all of the variables with it. It's an early start time. It's going to be good weather. You get your pace groups. There's literally no hills. And so it's, like, all these things are controlled. You get amazing fast times. The Olympics is like, in, I say this in the nicest way possible, a shit show. Like you, it's going to be crazy conditions. Probably you get people making crazy moves and doing stuff. The course is going to be insane. It's super hilly. So it's like you get none of that control of the variables. And I think you have to learn to just kind of roll with the punches. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I feel like that is a big aspect of it. And the more that you try and control every aspect of a race, the more it backfires on you. Yeah. And I think here you're kind of distinguishing almost like there's two types of, in ways like professional marathoning, Mm -hmm. there's like the time trials of when people are trying to set records. And Mm -hmm. then there's also like the racing style of competitive racing and that Mm -hmm. the Olympics have where it's, it's not perfect conditions. Yeah. And so I'm hearing from you, it's like, yeah, the trials is a place to actually practice that Mm -hmm. style of racing. And I think that's it is like, we're moving into this era where a lot of races are becoming those time trial style races. You look at Berlin, you look at Chicago, you even look at this McCurdy marathon that just happened where they're doing it on literally the flattest loop that they could find. And you get incredible times out of it and you get great. It's a different style of racing, but, and it's a cool style of racing, but it's very different. And I don't know if I'm just like an old school person that I, it's like, I love the messiness and the craziness of like the old style races. That's why I love New York. That's why it's like, I really want to go back and race Boston because it's, you get a little bit more of just like the wackiness. You don't know what the weather is going to be. You don't know what kind of moves people are going to make. Like, I think that's what makes this fun. I I really respect the Berlins and the Chicago's and and the flat, fast, like controlled marathons. But I also think there still is a place for the crazy stuff that goes down in the Olympics. And I think our trials needs to reflect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you're kind of speaking to like you and your internal wiring as a runner is it's Mm -hmm. like you're really lit up Mm -hmm. by that wacky, messy, Mm -hmm. like competitive environment. You also are someone who does respond well in the heat. Like you are. (laughs) Yeah. And so I think also like, yeah, I mean, I'm Mm -hmm. not a professional runner, but I Mm -hmm. like disintegrate in hot weather running. (laughs) Um, And so, Mm -hmm. but I understand it's like for you, it's both just the mental side of it and your body is able to adapt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I realize that this is my like, yeah. uh, What should I call it? Like my hot athlete privilege or like that that goes like a different way but like I I am someone that enjoys running in the heat I I feel like I train well in it and we like but that's the thing too is like I have specifically trained very hard for like the the hot conditions because like 
like more hot takes global warming things are only going to get hotter in these races specifically like in all the majors it looks like it's heading that way and i like I, I joke all the time i'm like no one has ever gone into a marathon and said i wish that i trained in the cold more like it's always trained for the worst possible option that it's going to be. That's what we did going into Chicago. John was convinced that Chicago was going to be crazy hot. And so he specifically kept making us work out in the heat, work out in a ton of clothes and whatnot to prepare for that. And then obviously on the day, it was like perfect conditions, really cold and whatnot. And at no point did I regret having heat trained for that because I think it just makes you stronger. So it's, yeah, Always assume that everything is going to be the worst possible, like, version of itself. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, I think that, like, I think it's kind of fun and exciting to think, like, yeah, trials might be insane. And, like, let's rise to that occasion. And I love, I mean, I think I love that mindset because mm-hmm. that's going to allow you to thrive in whatever, mm-hmm. whatever condition and environment happen. Yeah. And that's, I think, what a part of what allowed you to make the team, yeah. like the last team. Yeah. And I think like, I understand from the safety like standpoint from a mass marathon when it's really hot, like when they just had to cancel Twin Cities, yes. I think that was an, an appropriate decision because when you have people who are running a four a five hour long marathon, they're just out there in the heat for much longer and that gets dangerous. And if you don't have enough water or medical staff I understand that the trials is comparatively so small so controlled the majority of people are finishing within a very specific set of time so it's like we control these conditions so you don't have to worry as much about some of those other factors so it's like yeah why not go for it like have it in whatever conditions we want yeah well said yeah so I don't know I'm I apologize to all the pro runners that are working very hard to make this happen. I appreciate you guys putting that energy into it, but that ain't me. Yeah. And it's okay for there to be different pro runners with different perspectives on this. And I I respect people who are doing that. Like, it's not my opinion, but I respect their right to, to petition and do this. And I know they feel very strongly about these things. And yeah, it's just like, it's just people's opinions at the end of the day. And so, yeah, we'll see if it gets moved earlier. If it does, cool. Like, I don't think it changes that much about the race. If it's really hot on that day, I don't know if it'll be that much cooler (laughs) at 8 a.m. I've raced in Florida. I've raced enough in Florida through college to know that like Florida is going to do what it's going to (laughs) do. Florida's a, yeah, Florida's a beast. Yeah. Shout out to all the people in Florida. Yeah. Shout out to <laughs> all you Florida men and women. Y'all are crazy. That's true. <laughs> so we spoke a little bit about what kind of your training is going to be like leading mm-hmm. into the trials, your physical training, that 14 day schedule. Mm-hmm. What do you feel like is going to allow you to stay mentally in a good space in these next four months? Mm. I think being able to like appreciate the importance of this goal to me and but not get too wrapped up in it and absorbed in it. Because, I mean, the last time around when I trained for trials, it was literally just going into it being like, this is a cool, fun thing that I'm training for. And it's definitely not going to be that mentality anymore because it's like, I can't, I can't put that genie back in the bottle and can't go back to this naive state of things. But I think being able to cultivate that same sense of just like, yeah, like it just is what it is. I'm going to train as hard as I possibly can and do all these things, but also work to respect my body and my mind in the process and not overdo it. Cause I've seen that overworking is almost more toxic than underworking. And Mm -hmm. so it's like being able to ride that line and not push too hard and not put everything riding on this. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 So it's like kind of taking this middle path for you. Exactly. there's a high intention and low attachment Mm -hmm. as something people say. Yeah. Is it's like having real, like real purpose, Mm -hmm. real drive, but also not being so attached to it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think that's it is it's very easy to lose yourself in a goal like this. Mm -hmm. And, and I've done that in the past. Like I've seen myself fade away in, in the pursuit of a goal and it just, it eats you up and spits you out the back end. Um, one of my friends, Bailey Myers, has like a good analogy of it. It's like holding like a an egg in your hand. And it's like if you hold it so tightly, it just breaks in your hand. And so it's like being able to respect that, that this is a beautiful, fragile thing. And I need to like do everything I can to cultivate it and not break it apart in my hands. Mm. And holding onto it too tightly will do that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Will you do any build-up races in the, in the build? 
yes, we will do some build-up races. I do not know what those build-up races will be yet. We're still trying to figure that out. We're looking to do a half, like, beginning of December. Um, I'm actually kind of making it a goal. Um, Jessa really wants to go out and try and run a fast half. And I think it would be, like... It, I think sometimes I need to be able to like get out of my own bullshit and like do things like race for other people sometimes too. So like a big goal of mine is like, yeah, I really want to pace Jessa into getting a fast half and PRing in, in this race. And I think that will keep me in check um, and like be able to help like benefit someone than myself because so running is such a selfish thing that it helps sometimes to re- go into a race realizing I'm like, yeah, I am not the most important thing here. Um, and yeah, so I think that half, like trying to help Jessa get, uh, um, uh, like a PR in the half because she's going to be doing this whole build with me, which is really exciting. I think that's like the fun part of all of this is like getting to do it with someone really excites me. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. beautiful. That's interesting. You speak to like running, being really self-focused. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would share with me a little bit more what you mean by that? I think running is just inherently selfish, not in necessarily a pejorative way. I think it can become pejorative, but you have to be so attuned to how your own body is feeling, your own needs, and like focusing on the constant state of yourself. Am I getting enough sleep? Am I eating this? Am I doing this? And it's very easy to let that become so myopic and so centered in just what you're doing that it becomes almost stifling Mm. and so it's riding that line of like okay I need to be very selfish these next few months but not let that become a it's it's hard because it sounds inherently really bad but that's just like the nature of what it is um I'm really glad that Matt is like very supportive of this and understanding of like what those needs are of like having to put my own needs first sometimes in order to make this stuff happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I almost like, I don't even, I don't know why I don't love the word selfish. I like mm-hmm. to think of it like almost like self-focused. Yeah. Is it like, I feel like selfish has this like kind of negative energy with yeah. it. Whereas it's like, yeah, this is a time where you're going to have to be really self-focused the mm-hmm. next four months. Yeah. Um, and make a lot of decisions with yourself in mind. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's making the decisions that sometimes aren't fun, but, and, and sometimes like, I feel like I'm a person that I like, I get this like the like deep anxiety about like having to put myself first sometimes because like it, it feels very selfish and I don't like that feeling. I don't like that feeling of like having to put myself first sometimes. And that's what I've struggled with a lot over my marathoning career, but it is sometimes realizing I'm like, yeah, I get a very short period of time to do this and appreciating. I'm like, I have the opportunity to get to go out and do like, like something that is really big and important to me. And I have to, I have to put that focus on it right now. Cause this is the only time that I'm going to like have to do this mm. and then I'll make it up to the people around me afterwards. I think you're an amazing friend. You brought me the coolest, some more sticks today that have my name engraved on them. You are very self. I, and I like doing the, the fun little gifts, but no, it's just like, it, it is respecting that though of just like, yeah, like it sucks when you're like in a marathon build and you don't have the capacity to like go and do like do some things outside, be there for people in the way that you want to be there of like, oh yeah, like we're all going and seeing Rocky Horror Picture Show at midnight. I'm like, I'm so sorry I can't, I've got a long run in the morning. You're like friends from college when they're all taking like a friend's trip or whatnot. I'm like, I'm sorry I can't. You miss you miss a lot doing these things because you have to be very self-focused. Um And so, yeah, it's just like with everything, it's finding that balance. Yeah. I also think running is really unique in that it's not like really you have a day off from your job. Like Mm -hmm. all the choices you make in your day (laughs) have an impact on your job. Yeah. Whereas it's like a lot of people can go to their job and then just leave the job. It's like, no, your job is like your entire lifestyle. I think that's what I realized like this past, like these last two weeks where I've been like able to take some downtime and downtime for me isn't necessarily like no running, like it, that always surprises people where I'm like, yeah, it's like my off week. And they're like, you still ran. I'm like, yeah, but like, t- like my off week for me is like, I'm going to stay up late and nobody's telling me to go to bed or like, I'm going to wait to run until 11 a.m. and stuff like that, where it's like, because yeah, it's like you said, like we don't like weekends, if anything, are our hardest work days. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like an entire marathon build is months of this 
full on focus every single day of everything you're eating, doing, sleeping, like all these things, it's really nice to be able to kind of just be like, fuck off, we're going and like, for example, I'm so excited for this race that your partner or your husband and um, my partner, Matt, are going to be doing in a few weeks where we <laughs> we are going down to Prescott and watching them run 50 miles against horses. And I am so excited to be able to spend the entire day, like not giving a shit about my own running or how much I'm sleeping or like staying off of my feet or like what I'm eating and literally just getting to like fuck around in the mountains of Prescott watching these guys race against horses. <laughs> that kind of, That is like my epitome of a break period. You have to tell listeners about the shirts. We need all the I need no, I need to get the I need to get rolling on the okay. shirts. Um, but no, the shirts. Uh, so for the listeners, the race is Man Against Horse in Prescott. It is where ultra runners compete against people who are riding horses and they see who comes first, whether it's the man or the horses. And Matt did this race last year. Um and the horse people are very passionate about their horses. We realize that this is a horse race that they allow people into. Um, and so I've decided to take a very anti-horse <laughs> stance on this year's race. So I'm making shirts for me and Jules and our friends who are coming down and Tim's family. Um, that is a horse face with a big old X across the middle and just say nay across the bottom um, to celebrate that we are supporting the men and not the horses. <laughs> I feel like that's going to be another hot date. Oh my God. The horse people are going to be so mad. Well, that's the thing is like the horse people are crazy (laughs) at this race. They are so all for it. They have like these beautiful horse trophies and like they talk about like there's like an award for the best conditioned horse, which I still have not been given parameters on what that means. And then they're just like, and first, second, third place of the runners, we go to these guys, get out of here. But it's a very fun race. I'm very excited for you guys to experience this. I'm so excited to be cheer squad for this race. We will report back in November of how Man Against Horse goes. Very much so. So when you think about November for yourself, what kind of is your intention or what at the end of the month would make the month feel really successful to you? Mm. So we're going to start our trials build like right around the beginning to middle of November, just kind of depending what John decides Um, So I think a lot of it is making sure that I'm like getting, like getting in quality training, but not being like, not, not like jumping the gun on it because now the fact that we've got just such a longer period to train for trials, it's very easy to get into this. Like I have to do everything all at once and whatnot. And it's like, no, like let's like be controlled with how we build into this. I've got a lot going on in November as well between uh, going out to New York city marathon, doing some shoe testing at Boston, um, some fun things later in the month that I can't talk about yet, but we will talk about in November. Um, but yeah, I think it's like making sure that I'm like, progressing this build correctly Mm. because it's going to be a longer build. You have to, in the same way that I try to control my energy leading into a race, I try to control my energy throughout a build of making sure that I'm going to be able to sustain myself and sustain that mental energy through the entire course. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. it sounds like it's kind of like, it's going to be the beginning Mm -hmm. of, of the chapter. Yeah. But it also sounds like you, it sounds like you kind of want to hold yourself back. Yeah. In the same way that like, like when you go and do a workout, like you aren't like guns blazing from mile one, like you got to warm up into it. Like I think of like right now as like my break period, the na- like the latter portion of October and that first week of November is kind of like the warm up, And then it's like, yeah, we're going to ease into this progression run. And then like, yeah, hopefully be hitting it really hard by December and then January, like definitely is like guns blazing. <laughs> and will there be any turkey costume appearance in November? I think there will be because I don't, I definitely want to be here in Flagstaff for Thanksgiving. I don't think I want to have to like go do like a Thanksgiving race. Okay. Um, and it was really fun last year doing the <laughs> run up Turkey Hill um, in the costume. So I, I need to get a new costume though. I think last year was, <laughs> last year was the, the last year for that one. We were taping on the tail. Yeah, though in the wings, I feel like. The wings were pretty rough too. Yeah, so there will be a new turkey costume. Maybe we should go to... There's a great one in Sedona. The Sedona Turkey Trot is actually really fun. 
Yeah. That's going to be a different beast, though, because that co- that costume will get hot if it is hot in Sedona. <laughs> you just said you love heat training. It's heat training. training. Oh, my God. This is perfect. <gasps> oh, my God. It all wraps up perfectly. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a hot turkey. The hot turkey. I will be fully baked by the end of that. Fully cooked. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think uh, we definitely want to be here, um, and I think that's going to be the best option. <laughs> okay. I lo- I'm looking forward to seeing this costume again. The turkey will fly again. Yes. Okay, this is so good. We never talked about your marathon. Everyone, Jules raced a marathon. I don't know. I don't think you could have raced, but I ran. But you raced a marathon. We can talk about it off, off air. Okay. Yeah, this is good. I'm really proud of you for Chicago. Thank you, Jules. Thank you for tuning in to our third episode of The Build Up, a Beyond the Pines production. Stay tuned once a month for a new episode from now until February 2024 as we continue to document Molly's mental and physical preparation for the 2024 Olympic Trials Marathon. Huge thanks to Matt Shapiro for photography and videography and John Summerford for music and audio production. You can also watch the live recording of the buildup on Molly's or Beyond the Pines' YouTube channels. Tune back in in November and be well until then.